you are looking at a person who is a living testimony to the Holocaust. At age 80, Murray Lynn might be expected to spend his days dwelling in the satisfied bliss of many accomplishments. Instead, for our sake, he intentionally relives nightmares almost too horrible for words. I just want the audience to remember that Auschwitz was the kingdom of death, that it swallowed up the young and the old, the meek and the mighty, the simple and the educated. And I hope that this kingdom of death that we experienced is immortalized for future generations so they will better understand why we must talk about this. For 11 years, Adolf Hitler dedicated himself and his regime to destroying all of the Jews of Europe. He nearly succeeded. But one survivor said it is not accurate to place responsibility for the Holocaust on this lone villain or even his army of Nazis. He says centuries of hate provided fertile ground for both the Third Reich and the Holocaust. What happened when Hitler came to power, uh, Hitler in a way pierced that facade of silence. A facade of silence, a hate that lay so close to the surface of European society that when given voice and power, it erupted into unimaginable barbarism. One person who, as a teenager, lost everyone and everything to that hate, believes a facade of silence still lurks, luring us again to slumber. And so he has awakened his own voice to sound the warning. As I got older, uh, when I turned 70, I came to the realization that my life is not entirely uh, my own. It belongs to a uh, tragic history. And from that, we need to draw some meaning, and we need to draw some direction, and we need to draw some lessons. But most of all, we want to send a message to the world for them to remember the consequences of silence, the consequences of, uh, of, of hatred. Every survivor of the Holocaust provides a unique and personal perspective. As you will learn, Murray Lynn survived not just the camp that slaughtered one and a half million people, but a terrible trauma prior to his deportation to Auschwitz. But despite all the terror and loss he endured, Murray Lynn not only held on to his life, but also to his humanity. We all have certain attributes, and I think the greatest attribute that I have is I cannot nurture hatred. All their clothes, their shoes, they had to dump them in one place and then we were selected, whether we're going to work or we're going to die. He was about the age of these visitors when he entered Auschwitz. But whether Murray Lynn's personal story, or even the Holocaust itself, is within the grasp of every young mind, is unlikely. The survival rules were never to let the Germans know that you are sick, that you're incapable of performing the slave labor. If you are a fighter, you can overcome adversity. If you're not a fighter, you capitulate. And I was a fighter. For most of his adult life, hardly anyone was aware of Murray Lynn's past. So his global business achievements, his enduring and happy marriage, his success as a father, while admired, may not have appeared that extraordinary. If only people had known. Even today, at 80-plus years, he remains a disciplined man, 
with a brilliant mind and a unique charm. He just never offered explanations for why he avoided trains or large dogs. Given what we know about the treatment of Europe's Jews before and during World War II, it is hard to believe any survived. But in thousands of places, Jewish survival amidst vastly larger European Christian communities has historically been a profound challenge. And so it was for all the Jews in the Hungarian town of Bielki, including a young man known to friends as Maurice. We were pretty much isolated from non-Jews. Uh, the Christian community did not want to have to, to do much with us. They, they did not, we were not integrated in the community. We knew the reasons why. Uh, it goes back uh, 1800 years. Uh, the church for many, many years uh, had a, uh, 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 their, their doctrine was encapsulated in four words. Jews are unrepentant sinners. We were treated as infidels, as heretics, and they wanted very little to do with us. And this was a, a, a weekly sermon in the church that Jews killed Christ, that Jews were unrepentant sinners, and we must be treated accordingly as pariahs and isolated. Hating Jews, uh, being intolerant of Jews was part of the DNA of its culture and creed. And there is not very much we can do to change their mindset. So we lived uh, almost in fear. Uh, we did not want to argue with these people because we knew it was a no-win game. Uh, and so we accepted our fate for many, many centuries as being the underclass. Some elements of the Christian church did protest Nazi treatment of Jews and other minorities. Those efforts were brutally suppressed. More commonly, however, widespread church indifference and even support for the Nazi policies existed in many parts of Europe. So what began in the early 30s with vile propaganda evolved with shocking haste into isolation, brutalization, deportation, and the systematic slaughter of Europe's Jews. And again, while Hitler provided the face for these acts, tens of thousands willingly carried out his orders, while millions passively ignored unmistakable indications of the ongoing crimes. Hitler emboldened those people he encouraged them when they realized that they can speak freely because it came from other powers. It emboldened them to be more anti-Semitic and it encouraged them to call us names. It encouraged them to taunt us. It encouraged them to mock us. It encouraged them to hate us. So things turned from being a passive we had sort of a passive relationship to a hostile relationship. With Hitler in power, Nazi-like paramilitary groups formed or reformed across Europe. In Hungary, Arrow Cross, a murderous anti-Jewish group, had existed since the 15th century when the Nazis began to ransack Europe. Hungary allied with Germany and thousands joined Arrow Cross which in 1942 began targeting for death educated Jews like Murray's dad, Abe. That was a, a turning point in our lives. Uh, that was the beginning of the end. I remember roughly at uh, two or three in the morning, we had a knock on the door and the two Arrow Cross fascists burst into our door, into our room and a wanted uh, to see my dad. We were all asleep. And when they told us, uh, when he saw that, they told them uh, to pack 
uh, to put his clothes on and pack his bags, whatever he wants to take with him, and follow them uh, to an unknown destination. We were hysterical when this happened. We all wanted to know why Dad was taken, where Dad was being taken, and what the charges were. But we, they were unresponsive. My dad was an educator and a community leader. And what they did first is they decided to surround all educators and community leaders to get rid of them first so the community remains leaderless. Dad was whisked away into uh, the silence only to be broken by barking dogs and whining wolves. That's all I remember. Two weeks later, we heard that Dad and roughly 15 other community leaders were marched to the Carpathian Mountains and forced to dig their own mass grave. And then they were all executed. This changed our lives forever. Suddenly we became vulnerable and very insecure. My mom didn't know what to do next. She didn't know how we we're going to survive. And how did Murray's non-Jewish neighbors and classmates react to the executions? My impression is that they were glad because we were outsiders. They told us that we did not belong there in that community. We were treated as strangers. And if they took away another Jew or killed another Jew, it was, it was a, a relief to many of them because it's one Jew less left in the community. I don't believe, knowing the mindset of those people in those days, I don't believe they cared. Mari's famously lovely mother, Regina, was suddenly very vulnerable. As the oldest of four sons, Murray tried to protect her. But just 13, he was no match for the armed fascist. Uh, I've only spoken about this two or three times in 60 years because it's too painful and I have a difficult time uh, facing it. We had another knock on the door and a narrow cross fascist soldier burst into our house and demanded to go to bed with my mom. I resisted it and he took out a gun and he says, if you don't stop it, he says, you'll be dead and no one will care. My mom told me to stop it. And I did. Next thing I knew, I woke up at six or seven in the morning. He was gone. My mom was never the same. By the spring of 1944, the war had turned sharply against Germany, confident that they could safely rely on the full participation of Arrow Cross. The Nazis nevertheless went ahead with their plans to annihilate Hungary's one million Jews. Roughly April 1944, uh, early morning, knock on the door, and uh, we were told to pack our bags and follow the Arrow Cross soldiers to the train station. Mom, I remember she pulled the sheets and blankets from our beds to put our belongings because we didn't have luggage in those days. Only the well-to-do had luggage. And we put pots and pans and bread and flour and whatever for subsistence. And I remember my mom tied all the baggage on our necks. It was a surreal scene that you only see in a movie. As we were trekking 
to the train station. It was an orchestrated scene on the street. So many of them are neighbors. Many of them we knew because it was a small community. We never believed that there was so much anger and hate and contempt for us as we were trudging with our baggage in our bags. They were hurling epithets at us, spitting at us, throwing rocks at us as we were led to our doom. Nobody, but nobody came to our assistance. There was no moral outcry in the community. Murray, now 14, with every other Jew in his town, was sent to a nearby city and into a ghetto created to serve as the temporary holding area. A few days later, Murray, his mother, and three brothers were shoved into an airless cattle car. For 72 hours, the train crept toward the death camp just across Hungary's border with Poland, Auschwitz. Unfathomable. People in the cattle cars were wailing and crying and praying for salvation. We had no food and no sanitation facilities. People had to relieve themselves in their clothes. There were no, no sanitation. For three days, we suffered this, uh, this dehumanizing experience. The cattle car smelled like a sewage plant. It was unbearable. Many older people died. The sick people died. When we got to Auschwitz, I don't remember how many people we took out of the cattle car dead. Oblivious even of where or what Auschwitz was, most of Murray's group was designated for a same-day execution. The door jerked open, and all of a sudden, we were surrounded by the Sonderkommando, uh, which were Jewish prisoners helping us unload, and they helped the Gestapo uh, with various chores, and surrounded also by the Gestapo and they started shouting at us in German to put their clothes in a certain area and to line up. The Sonder Commandos came up to the train and they took off many of those who couldn't walk, uh, those who were too sick or those who were too tired. The very first thing we saw were the smoke belching chimneys and the smell of flesh and we knew immediately that Something, something is going on here, but we had no idea. These are Auschwitz photos of Hungarian Jews taken in early May of 1944, the very week Murray and his entire community arrived. It seemed that even those who feared the worst tried to remain as calm as possible and to comfort the children. The young, young kids were less affected. We were more resilient than the older people. We didn't think as far as deep as some of the older people. Mom was re very reassuring. She was a very um, positive person. I remember she would tell us, don't worry, I'm behind you, I'm with you. Everything is gonna be all right. Don't worry about it, we'll all make it. Well, just let's pray to the heavens. And she gave us peace and solace uh, to the very last moment. The last moment Murray would ever share with his family occurred within minutes after the family staggered down from the cattle car. We were immediately separated. My mom huddled around my three brothers. She was sent to one side and I was sent to the other side. The people, those capable of working, the younger guys uh, under 30, under 35, were separated for work, for uh, slave labor camp, and the rest of them were assigned. And they were told that they were going to take a, um, a disinfectant bath. And I remember a Sunder commando told us, told me, 
tell him you are 16. I was 14, tell him you're 16. He knew something I didn't know. If I was 16, they would assign me to work. And all I remember, the only thing I remember, my mom was hysterical when they yanked me away from her and she bid me a farewell. The last thing she said, I love you, son. I hope to see you again. And that was the last time I saw my mom and my three brothers. I was assigned a striped suit. My number was 83,000. And I asked one of the prisoners, would you by any chance know where my mom and three brothers went? And he paused for a minute or two and didn't know what to tell me, didn't know whether he should tell me or not. He asked me to come out of the barracks, says, come on out, I'll show you where they are. And for a moment, I was relieved. He takes me out of the barrack and then points to the chimney. That's where they are. This was roughly an hour after we were separated. This is how swiftly death came to these people. I said to myself, I'm alone. I have no incentive anymore to remain alive. Like most prisoners, he would regain his will to live, but will was rarely enough to overcome their captor's commitment to kill them all. Inhuman conditions were the rule, beginning with barracks in which 500 were crammed, where no more than 75 could possibly have hoped to survive. Three-tier barracks, we slept three people per bunk, so there were nine people. The, uh, the worst barrack, the worst bunk was the bottom one because they took everything from uh, all the incontinence and, and diarrhea and, and uh, everything that came from, from the top two tiers. Uh, they, uh, uh, they were the receivers of all the indignities uh, over, over the, overnight. But uh, we slept without blankets. We were given blankets. We were assigned blankets uh, initially. It was so brutally cold that we took those blankets, most of us, and tore them up and made vests out of them. And we could not show those vests because we would have been brutalized by the Germans or even murdered. We took them, those vests under our shirts. And uh, some of us uh, used paper bags from cements where we worked in factories and made uh, vests out of them to, to survive. Each morning, Murray helped to remove a dozen or more corpses from the barracks. Then the night's survivors lined up for their guards to decide who could still work and who instead would be murdered. They didn't count us. They knew that we could not escape. But the roll call, the purpose of the roll call was to cull the sick and the uh, emaciated and those who are incapable of working. And they told them they were going to the hospital. Well, the hospital was a euphemism for the gas chambers. I was picked no less than 10, 12 times to go to the hospital because I was too weak and too emaciated. And I slipped back to the line because I knew what a hospital meant. Uh, my cousin, I had a cousin with me there, his name was Sam Green, and he volunteered to go, quote, to the hospital, and I said to him, Sam, do you realize that this is not a hospital you're going to? Do you realize where you're going or what you're doing? And he said something to me again that haunts me still. And my Hungarian name was Maurice, and it says, Maurice, I know where I'm going. I will only suffer for 10 or 15 minutes, but she'll suffer until you die an undignified death from starvation. He says, who is better off, you or I? For the slaves of Auschwitz, death was usually gradual, horrible, and inevitable. 
Murray's body became skeletal as he carried 50 pound cement sacks for 14 hours each day. And acts of cruelty or murder could come at any minute. I'll never forget, uh, a sergeant came over to me when I was in uh, Auschwitz. And it's the only time I was threatened with my life. He comes over to me and he says, Junge, was habst du aufgefressen, dass du hier bist? I violated the rule of answering. I said, gar nicht. And he slapped me so hard that the thrust knocked me probably about 20 feet from him. I was blind, bloodshot and blind in one eye and deaf on my ear probably for weeks on my left side. Diseases like typhus, dysentery and cholera kill thousands. Though the biggest killer of prisoners was unrelenting starvation. Hunger assaults your mind and the body until it become delirious. All you do is you hallucinate about food. It was impossible to survive on what they fed us. We were given a cup of coffee and a slice of bread in the morning, nothing at noontime, and at night a cup of foul-tasting potato soup. This was roughly 150 to 180 calories a day. The difference between those who survived and those who perished had a great deal to do with a mindset there has to be an innate gift. If you believe in God, it may be a God-given gift. Uh, but it's a gift that I had to fight for life. And I fought for life every inch of the way, every moment of the day. I knew that I wanted to live. I knew that I wanted to survive. I knew that I was the only one in my family who survived at that point. Deprivations at Auschwitz spared no one. So despite being a young teenager, Murray says he rarely got special considerations from his fellow prisoners. You will probably hear different stories from different people, but my memory and my impression was that with few exceptions, we all became animalistic. We were all fighting for survival and we became desensitized about each other. By early 1945, Russian soldiers were at the gates of Auschwitz. Lacking time to kill and dispose of their bodies, the Nazis elected to march thousands of prisoners, including Murray Lynn, hundreds of miles to camps in Germany. Over the course of 10 brutal cold days, Murray fought to put one foot in front of another as the hateful Nazis committed murder all around him. When I remember when we were marching on the death march, when uh, the they guards clobbered the sick people to death because they didn't want to waste a bullet on them. We knew that if we could just survive this terrible ordeal, that ultimately we would be liberated, but we didn't know how long it's going to take. We heard the planes flying above us. We knew that it's close, but we didn't know if we can survive long enough to see the daylight. It was an abyss of the worst kind. Now, when I was liberated, uh, I weighed roughly 60, 62 pounds, something like that. I was semi-comatose condition. I could not walk. Uh, my mind was uh, barely functioning, and I was taken to the hospital, and I was fed intravenously for two weeks, which I was lucky uh, because those of us who ate, who had access to too much food, died. Hundreds of them died because they overate. Their bodies could not absorb the food. As soon as he could walk, Murray joined Europe's massive refugee population. He managed to stay alive for the months it took him to walk back to what had been his Hungarian home. This is the same path that I took home 15, roughly 15 months later, where an orchestrated gang of people were lining up the street, taunting us. Here I'm walking home on a dark evening by myself, with nothing in my hands. 
And what is cascading through my mind is, what am I going to do next if no one is home? What am I going to do if somebody is home? And when I knocked, finally got to our home, I knocked on a door, and a stranger opened the door, a hostile stranger, and he shouts at me, he said, I thought you were all dead. I didn't remember him, but he knew me. And instinctively, I said to him, I'm the ghost. The Holocaust, Murray discovered, had made ghosts of virtually every Jew but himself. And he had no protection from hostile townspeople. Plus, now he had a new enemy, Stalinist communism, that was sweeping into Hungary and elsewhere and often arresting Holocaust survivors. Meanwhile, many Jews had decided to board ships for Israel, despite the inevitability of a war with its Arab neighbors. Murray, however, went to Ireland when a Jewish benefactor offered to transport him and other Jewish orphans for schooling in an old castle there. Less than a year later, the Irish government expelled them all for being Jewish. Some of us would have stayed in Ireland. There were two or three families that wanted to adopt me in Ireland, Jewish families. Uh, I was a good looking kid and uh, I was a charismatic kid, more so than I was now. I was full of spirit. And they were, uh, I had uh, two or three offers to be, to be adopted by wealthy families. And they wouldn't let me stay. Five decades later, Murray would return to Ireland with his best friend from his castle stay. The government extended them an apology for having forced the Jewish orphans to find another home in another country. That home for Murray turned out to be the United States, which welcomed him in 1949. Now, by almost any measure, he has achieved enormous success by any measure but his own. I'm happy with my children's success. I'm happy with uh, my wife, with my acquisitions in life, but I'm not happy with myself. There's a big difference. Uh, because material things don't mean, I'm not a ostentatious guy. I'm not a uh, grandstander. I'm not a guy that has to do something to impress people. That's against my nature, against my personality. So these things mean less to me than the ordinary person. This is why I said I never, never made it to the finish line. Because of the personal void in my life. Not family void, but my void as a result of losing my parents young, of not having the love of my parents, not having the embrace, not having the security of my parents, not knowing how my life would have ended had this monster not intervened in our lives. This is why I have a void and this is why I will always feel to the very end that I never made it to the finish line. My circle is not complete in that respect. A few years ago, Murray Lynn returned with family members to Auschwitz, where he read a deeply personal letter composed to his mother. Here's a small excerpt. Mom, this vile and dehumanizing kingdom of genocide is now a historical bulwark against future barbarians. We are united in our resolve to never let that happen again. Your martyrdom was not in vain. We have solemnly pledged to never let the world forget our suffering, nor the abysmal fall of humanity. That legacy continues to provide us lessons and warnings. One came in the spring of 2010, when the sign at the Auschwitz gate was stolen by Polish neo-Nazis. And the day after their visit to the extermination camp, the spirit of the Lynn family was terribly wounded back in his native Hungary. As we are walking the streets in Budapest, 
a car pulls over next to us and a young man jumps out of the car. He must have been in the early 20s and raises his arm and he says, Heil Hitler, and jumps back in the car. And my daughter was with me at that time. And I said to my daughter many times when she was young, don't forget who you are, because if you do, uh, someday someone is going to remind you. To remind you. In the end, that's what Holocaust survivors like Murray Lynn say they feel compelled to do. To remind you that hatred, even in its most vicious and diabolical forms, takes no holiday. We must, they say, keep watch both on the world and on ourselves. We must fight for a better world than the world of my childhood. You must never give up.